I work in a fairly busy hospital downtown in the NICU. I usually work at night, and I kid you not, this happened to me less than five minutes ago. I figured it would be good to get this down in writing before I forgot. It's also a way for me to have some sort of proof in case something comes of it. During orientation, we are taught to be observant to the signs of a possible abductor. We were taught to look for oversized clothing, bags, and shifty behavior. Luckily, I've never encountered a strange individual until just now. It's currently 2.59 a.m., and I've been sitting at the front desk since 11. I'm a nursing student, so I usually just do clerical work around the unit. I also watch the cameras to make sure no one is here that isn't supposed to be here. It's usually pretty quiet at night. However, I've already had a sort of weird night, so this just adds a cherry on top of it. The NICU and most of the second floor is a locked unit. That means that in order to gain entrance, you have to pick up a phone which then rings to the desk. Usually it's parents wanting in to see their babies and family members who are lost. It quiets down around 11, so no one usually comes in or out during my shift, with the exception of housekeeping. One of the security cameras is situated so I can see who is picking up the first phone. I had been sitting here browsing Reddit when the phone rang. I glanced over at the phone, thinking it was a parent wanting an update or something like that. It took me a second to register that it was the number for the first set of doors slash phone. I picked it up and looked over to the screen. There was a lady in baggy clothing with a sling on her arm. I answered the door, and she said she wanted in to find her cousin, who apparently had been brought up from the emergency department. I asked for the last name, and she unintelligibly rambled off a Latino name that I only caught the first part of. Knowing that we did not have any new admissions, I told her we didn't have anyone by that name. I tried to get some information out of her, and she again said that her cousin had been brought up from the ED. I told her in that case she would want to go to labor and delivery and talk to them. She hesitated, then said okay and walked away. I got a really weird feeling from her, so I checked the census to see if there was anyone that was being assessed in L&D, and there wasn't. So either she was at the wrong hospital, or she wanted in the unit to do something a little bit more sinister than just to see her cousin. I shrugged it off and figured that her cousin was in L&D and that she would find her and all would be well. About five minutes later, the same lady appeared in her extremely baggy clothing in her sling. The only difference was that this time, she was putting the sling on and using her injured hand to mess with something in her oversized sweatshirt. She picked up the phone and once again asked to be let in to find her cousin and that Ellen D said that they had no one by that name. I told her the exact same thing and that she would need to get in contact with her cousin and go back to Ellen D. She got hostile for a second and then hung up the phone. Whether or not she was trying to gain access to the unit for things she shouldn't be doing, I'll never know. But creepy lady who looked like a baby snatcher, let's not ever meet again. About 14 years ago, a friend and I were living on the edge, sneaking out of the house after her father had fallen asleep around 1 a.m., she lived in a safe, quiet neighborhood, and our main, or only, goal was to walk around, chat, see if there were any cute, adolescent boys outside on a similar mission. But, after about 20 minutes of walking around, our dreams began deflating, because it seemed like no one else was out. But then, my friend spotted a boy about 200 feet down the road. We could tell his hair was green, and we already believed that maybe he'd be edgy enough to spark some interest. We slowly approached, and as we walked by, I distinctly remember that we made eye contact before continuing on and giggling like nervous school children. Within five minutes, as we had continued, though slowly, 
to walk up the same street, we heard a few voices behind us. We turned, and instead of just one green-haired boy, there were now four to five. From the distance and in the dark, they seemed big, intimidating and angry. We kept hearing them yelling questions. Aren't you out past your bedtime, you sluts? And, that's right, you better keep walking fast. Don't want to miss getting home to daddy. As we picked up our pace, they did the same. We decided to walk down an alley, not smart, we both realized. But just down and across a fairly major intersection was a lit gas station. Our plan was to go in there and ask for help, maybe getting the clerk to call the police. We began running down that alleyway once we saw that they were still following us, still calling us sluts and children and bitches. It seemed that our nervous laughter had instead inspired some sort of anger in them. Maybe the boy thought we had been laughing at him, poking fun. Whatever it was, they were pissed and they wanted to mess with us right back. We made it into the gas station and watched as they wandered off. We must have waited at least another 20 to 30 minutes. When they had first come up behind us, we thought it was just a quick joke, an interaction that would come to a steady close. But they had followed, and we hadn't seen all their faces. After 20 to 30 minutes had gone by, we decided to try walking home. We took the back streets, since they had only seen us on the main one. We figured we were safe because they'd been gone for so long and we didn't see anyone around. We made it about four blocks before they reappeared. I heard an engine puttering along slowly. I turned around, and I explicitly remember letting out a momentary sigh of relief. The car behind us was a Mustang. I remember stupidly assuming that no green-haired punk kid would have a Mustang. I was wrong. The first face I saw in the car was his. We were on the sidewalk, and they had driven right up next to us, still asking the same questions. This time, I didn't see any other girls with them. We kept saying we were sorry, we hadn't meant anything, but they just kept laughing and staring at us. Finally, as we came up to a street that we would have to cross, the car door opened. The green-haired boy opened his door and reached out to grab my leg, attempting to snatch me toward the car. I shrieked, and we both sprinted across the street. They sped up to make a right turn, positioning their vehicle right behind us. I remember feeling the breeze and heat of their car right behind my legs. They even tried to hit us. We dove into some bushes and crawled into a yard. Some drunken older women had a barbecue going. And as we crawled into their yards, 14 years old and sobbing, they scooped us up, told us to calm down, and to call the police. We did, and the cops came and asked us questions. Afterwards, the women gave us a ride back to my friend's house. I always wondered why the cops let them drive us, even though they were clearly drunk. Anyway, I hope I never meet any of those green-haired boys again. This story takes place on a winter's night in a small town in southern England. I'm a male and was around 17 at the time. I was over at a friend's house for a few drinks as we were too young to hit the pubs and the weather too cold to drink in the woods as usual. My friend lived around two miles from where I lived and around halfway home there was a shortcut through the woods, where we regularly hung out, which would shave off a precious few minutes on my walk home. We were having a good time, and enjoying a few cans of cider. I think it's a rite of passage for English youth. And at around 11pm, I decided to head home, as I had work the next morning. I headed out of my friend's house and through the alleyway to the main road. It was here that I noticed someone on the other side of the road about half a mile back. I thought nothing of it. It's a quiet town, and I had made this walk plenty of times before without issue. As I started walking, 
I felt an odd sensation, and the hairs on my neck started to stand on end. I turned around to see the person had crossed the road and was now walking on the same side of the road as me, still away behind, but I could see it was a large man with a hooded top on. Being a relatively switched on person, I decided to cross the road to see if he copied me. No sooner had I done that. Sure enough, the man followed suit. At this point, I started to nope out and walk faster. I kept checking behind me, and he too was walking faster, and there was a glint of something in his hand. Now it could well have been anything, but my brain was telling me this guy had a knife. I continued walking until I was around 100 meters away from the shortcut. Now, I had a decision to make. Do I take the shortcut through the woods? Or do I continue another half mile towards the main road, where there was likely cars? As I mentioned earlier, I spent a lot of time in those woods, and felt that I would at least have a chance to lose this guy in there. I looked back and the guy was around 200 meters behind me now, and gaining fast. My fight or flight kicked in, and I started sprinting towards the gate and the shortcut. Now, the shortcut was a small, unlit dirt road, wide enough for a car to fit down, with back gardens on one side, long grass on the other, and tree roots littering the path. As I rounded the gate and onto the path, I checked back, and the man was fully sprinting behind me. I got about ten meters down the path and tripped on one of the roots, falling flat on my face. Part darkness, part alcohol, is to blame, I would say. I knew I had seconds to make a decision on what to do before he got to the gate. I didn't think I could get up and go quick enough, plus my knee was shot after falling down. I did the first thing that came to my mind, and I rolled off of the path and into the tall grass, and lay there, trying to be as silent and still as possible. A moment later, I heard the gate rattle, and someone walk up the path behind me. Unable to see, as I was lying on my front facing forward, I prayed that he would not spot me. The man lingered for a moment around four feet away from where I was laying, catching his breath. He was breathing real heavy, and I could tell he was straining his eyes to try and see down the path in the dark. After what felt like eternity, he started walking off down the path, and I watched him go as far as I could see in the dark. My heart was beating fast, and the adrenaline was pumping through my body. I had sobered up very fast, and was now acutely aware of every single noise in the woods. I waited around ten minutes after I last saw him before getting slowly to my feet. I very slowly made my way towards the road, listening carefully for any noises that were out of place in the woods, and keeping a low profile, moved back towards the gate. As I reached the gate, I heard a loud bang behind me. I spun around and saw a black cat had just jumped onto one of the fences. No sign of the man. I made my way onto the road and managed to get home without any further incident. Needless to say, I was incredibly wary whenever we returned to the woods for a drink. Potential knife-wielding murderer... Let's not meet.